Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about René Descartes' idea about I think, therefore I am, or what he means when he says I think, therefore I am, or more appropriately, je pense, donc, je suis, which is the exact same thing but in French. Je pense, I think, donc, therefore, je suis, I am. Or in Latin, cogito ergo sum, which I mispronounce, but you all know it. Ergo, you all know it. Before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, like, share, subscribe, you can see more than 300 episodes I already have up. If you want to help me out, you can do all those things I just mentioned. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure to do that. You can follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find the audio on its own on a podcast platform under all the same titles and stuff. If you found this as a podcast, you're going to be able to find the video of it on YouTube, if you want that. So yeah, let's uh, not beat around the bush any longer. Let's talk about this very important idea. The idea that by thinking, you can prove that you exist. So I'm going to approach this largely from his text called Meditations on First Philosophy. However, the term first emerges in his discourse on method and will come up in the rest of his text. And it isn't something that he totally formalizes. That is, he doesn't exactly lay out what he means by it in a super clear way. But we, we know what he means, and I'm going to explain to you what he means. I'm just going to do it through his text, Meditations on First Philosophy, instead of Discourse on Method, because I feel like Meditations on First Philosophy gives us a clearer idea of what's going on. So in order to do it, then, I'm going to give a little a brief recap of that text if you want a broader exposition of it then you can go and find the episode I the episode that I've done on it but if not what I'm going to do here will suffice for you to understand what's going on so he begins this text by wanting to question whether or not he can faithfully believe or believe that objects exterior to him outside of him like if you're watching this there's a little stuffed seal next to me whether or not this seal is really there, or if it's just a figment of my imagination. And the reason he asks this question is that he says, or well, it comes out of his inability to know when he is dreaming. So he finds that when he's dreaming, he thinks everything is real in his dream. He doesn't actually, he isn't actually able to tell whether or not he's dreaming or he's awake. So he says, okay, in those moments where I believe myself to be awake and conscious, I might actually be dreaming and I don't know it. So how do I then know that I am not living in an illusion, a kind of matrix-like world? And he suggests that this would have maybe been created by some kind of evil demon, at least that's the term that many people take up. But really I think the term that we find, at least in the translation, is evil genius. And the reason that he ascribes this to an evil genius is because he doesn't want to ascribe it to God. Because if there is a God, God would be supremely good. And therefore, God wouldn't want to dupe us, make us unsure about what is happening in the world. Because the world is only mediated to us through our senses. We don't actually have a real connection with it. The example I like to give is that a dog can hear a dog whistle and we can't. doesn't mean the dog whistle or the sound coming from it does not exist, but that because we are limited by the fact that we are humans, by our senses, we don't actually perceive everything out there in the world. So how can we be sure then about things that we actually see that they are coming to us as they actually are and not just being skewed through our senses? So he suggests that it would be like an evil genius, an architect like the Matrix. Don't get too hung up on that connection, but in any case, I think that it's it's a decent illustration of what Descartes is trying to describe. So he seeks to answer the question, if we cannot be sure of the world, that is, it might all be an illusion, what can we be sure of? Is there anything we can cling on to that we know for sure cannot be doubted? So in the beginning of his text, we can imagine him isolating himself in some kind of wood cabin with a little fire next to him, and he's trying to doubt everything. He's doubting 
the existence of objects in the world. He's doubting the world. He's doubting people's judgments about things. He's doubting other people, whether they exist or if they're just a figment of his imagination. But through this process, he, th he says to himself, like, there has to be something. And so he initially lands on the idea that, well, he's here. He, he, he has to be at least present for him to actually have these doubts. So there must be something there. And he gives us the idea that he is, therefore he is. Or in his words, because it's in the first person, I am, therefore I am. But there's a problem with this, in that his recognition of himself is reducible to his body. That is, he you know, just sees his body and he's like, that must be real. But even our attachment to our own bodies is filtered through us, through to us, through our senses. That is, I only know what I look like because I see myself in the mirror. I only know what I feel like because I touch myself with my own hands. And that sense data is then interpreted by our brain and it gives us an idea of what we look like, what we feel like, what we smell like. And therefore, even ourselves are mediated through ourselves, as weird as that might sound. Not to mention the fact that all people are going to have different perceptions of who we are and what each other person is like. But what remains consistent is the fact that among all people, even if we have different understandings of the world, different perceptions of it, what remains consistent is the fact that there are human minds actually seeing, observing, interpreting that world. Now, on this point, he suggests that it is not as though our minds are creating the world out there. I mean, for him, only God can do that. However, because our minds are always tuned to deciphering the world, to trying to understand the world, and going even beyond the world to think about things like God, we are then predisposed for Descartes to thinking about the infinite. And because we have that propensity to think about the infinite, he says that this is because our creator, God, stamped this ability onto us because God is synonymous with the infinite, which is a bit of a logical leap if anyone, you know, if anyone's read this, you can understand that at this point he's just trying to prove, uh, prove God, his religious upbringing. But in any case, the point is very strong in that he is describing what is universal among all these people. That is their propensity to think. So he found that as he was doubting everything, as he was calling into question virtually everything in his life, what he found that he could not do was doubt the very process of thinking or of doubting, which requires thought. And because that would require the act of thought. And you cannot unthink your own thought because that requires thinking. So no matter what, so long as you are in the process of thinking, you are then existing. You then exist because you cannot not think yourself or doubt your process of thinking because that would require thought. So when he says, I think, therefore I am, he's suggesting that thinking is the universal attribute of, of all thought. And he qualifies this in this course on method and other texts by saying that, uh, you know, you have to think in an orderly way. And he prescribes this act of doubting, doubting everything in the world in order to develop the proper faculties for critical philosophical thought that would open the door to new dimensions. Then, you know, People later on, like Immanuel Kant, would have take issue with this, where Immanuel Kant says that we can't just totally disregard things that happen in the world. So Kant situates Descartes among other skeptics, skeptics in this sense referring to people who are skeptical about the existence of the outer world, like Berkeley and others. Kant says he can't totally discount that. In fact, we can glean certain unchanging truths about ourselves in the world simply by engaging with empirical reality, thing, things out there exterior to us, which I'll talk more about in future episodes. Maybe I'll do one specifically on Kant and, and Descartes. But in any case, this should give you the idea or the ability to properly grasp what Descartes means when he says, I think, therefore I am. Thinking being the universal attribute that cannot be undone or that cannot be uh, erased because that would require the act of thinking itself if it is, for him, conducted in an orderly philosophical way. So yeah, I hope that that was illuminating. If there's anything that I excluded, I'd love to hear about it, but let me know what you think. Like, do you buy it? Uh, do you th what are the implications of this thought? Like, can we use it for anything? How do we go beyond this? 
If there's anything I got wrong, let me know, or I forgot, like I said, let me know if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. You can leave reviews on a podcast platform, I'd really appreciate it. And yeah, on that note, take care.